Good afternoon and welcome everybody, all our workers. Glad that you're here. We got an opportunity to cool off a little bit in our, our guests um, here today to hear our speaker. Um, our speaker today is Dr. John Bratton. He is the chair and professor of anthropology of the uh, University of Florida. And his topic today is Cuban chugs. Dr. Bratton will be speaking on the Chug Conservation and Restoration Project. Um, the Artifact Conservation, uh, American Time Archaeological Tracking, and the Decades of History that Connects Key West with the, uh, Cuba. Uh, through a grant from the Florida State Division of Historical Resources, this project will restore and protect the garden's existing Chug exhibit um, of the migrant and trace the uh, migration of Cubans uh, to the United States. Uh, this Cuban ex Chug exhibit is one of the few and, and probably the largest uh, Chug exhibit in, in not only Florida, but the United States. So with that, Dr. Bratton, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll correct uh, one, one thing you said. I'm actually uh, from the University of West Florida, not the University of Florida, in Pensacola. And so I've actually been there 25 years. And I learned early on to do all the work that I do and want to do is to use my students. And so, you know, I want to thank uh, these guys. You know, they we drove down this time, and so we're all the way from Pensacola. We left at four o'clock in the morning. But this is Brittany, Matt, and Chrissy, and Sienna. And so, for the last two days, uh, we were here at nine o'clock this morning. Yesterday, at ten o'clock this morning, all day long. And so, we're we're documenting all the vessels. Now, Ed asked me about uh, giving a talk here, and I said, well, what, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, you want me to talk about natural archaeology, artifact conservation, the Cuban jugs, and he said, all that. And so that's the kind of the PowerPoint that I put together. So I'm going to kind of tell you about a little bit about what we do and then how we transition to this. I don't know the history as well as you do, I'm sure. And, uh, so we're really looking at these chugs, is how are they built, how are they constructed, looking at them. And so I, I was trained in nautical archaeology from Texas A&M University. So they have a world famous nautical archaeology program started by George Bass. He's the quote unquote father of underwater archaeology. And this is my second career. I've been doing this for 25 years, actually 27 years, but over two years for the state. But in the former life, I was a high school science teacher in Nebraska. <laughs> and I was single, and one day I was asked to cover study hall, because the study hall teacher was sick. And so I went into the library, and I told the students in my stern voice, I said, okay, sit down, get busy, do your homework. But I was looking for something to read. And the study hall joined the library, and the librarian was great. If we had new books, she'd put them out where the students could see them. There's a brand new book, and it's called The Sea Remembered. It was it's written from a, actually a man from Florida. His name was Peter Throckmorton. He was a journalist. And so he wrote the first real book about maritime archaeology, nautical archaeology, underwater archaeology, all those same names, but looking at shipwrecks and what they can tell us and things like that. I thought it was fascinating. And so I looked in the books and where people you know that contributed to this you know where did they go to school and such well i found out there was a program at east carolina university and so i contacted them and said well our program's in history and i said well my bachelor's degree is in biology and my master's degree is in science education and they said well you'd have to take you know quite a few history courses before we let you in i said okay then I called Texas A&M University and I said, well, this is my background. And they said, that's great. We think there's a, a large overlap in archaeology, you know, the sciences, history, and all those programs. So I applied. I was accepted and ultimately earned a PhD in, uh, in anthropology, specializing in nautical archaeology. And then I received a phone call that uh, a shipwreck had been discovered in Florida, in Pensacola dating to 1559, and they needed someone to act as the conservator for the project, someone to take care of the artifacts. And so I said, well, you know, that sounds really good, but I have to write a dissertation. And uh, 
anyways, they flew me to Florida. First time I'd been to Florida. And uh, first time anybody paid an airline ticket for me. <laughs> and then I arrived, and I thought, this is too great an opportunity to pass up. And I had won a dissertation fellowship that the rule was all this money, large sum of money, um, they were going to give me, but I couldn't work. And I went back and I told the office, I said, can I turn this down? And I said, no one's ever done that before. Well, I was the first, apparently. And so when I arrived in Florida in 1994, I've been here ever since. So normally I get um, talks about you know, shipwrecks underwater. And so um, what I want to bring up the Cuban Chug Boat Project, which uh, we kind of turned down to documenting hope we resolved. To, to capture this. But we have lots of shipwrecks in Pensacola, and I've had all the work I could possibly handle. I have a colleague named Ray Cook, and uh, the two of us, we've taken out students every year. We offer maritime or classical field schools, and we train them in how to report things in the water. We teach them ship construction, and then I bring them into the lab during the year, and they work doing the artifact conservation, how to preserve these things. And all four of these students have spent countless hours in my lab doing that. So this is the Catherine. And so this was a, a lumber ship that arrived in Pensacola in 1894 and uh, sank during the winter storm. And it's a great story. It's a great non project that we worked on. But it's not what I'm here to talk to you about. <laughs> And we find shipwrecks, and then sometimes people just tell us about shipwrecks. You say, well, you know, there's a steamboat over in Seminole, Alabama, on the Black River, Blackwater River over there. We say, no. And we go over to the river, and sure enough, this is the hub from a paddle wheel to a side wheel steamer. The whole vessel is intact. And so it's, it's listing at a steep angle along the side of the bank. It sank during the storm. And we would dive down to this. It's pretty murky. But we could go to where the engine cover uh, is to go down to the engine room. We could dive down in there and we would take flashlights and we were looking. And we could read the maker's mark on the name of the engine, John A. Carney and Sons, 1870, New York City. And then the floor of the engine room is covered with linoleum. And under that linoleum, early use of linoleum, under that linoleum was newspapers that they put down for insulation. And we could read those newspapers underwater. And we were reading about Stanley and Livingston expedition, which was really cool. But this is not what I'm here to talk to you about. <laughs> you have a new guest. We did fly. Yeah. So, So he's, he's talking about stuff that, that has to do with what we got going on. But I love it. Uh, um, I, uh, I do have to share about this happening. That, uh, the, uh, the exciting part of this process was when I, uh, when I, uh, um, we approached Dr. Bratton and he says, you know, I usually bring them up from the water. <laughs> <laughs> or right here. So it set up a whole new uh, uh, angle of what his work seems to be. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely. And without a doubt, this is one of the prettiest places I've ever been sent to work to, to record uh, uh, boats and, and uh, this type of thing. And so this, this is just lovely and, and ideal. And as you do, I'm sure, tropical storms come in, hurricanes come in, Pensacola, we get our fair share. And after every storm, sometimes we'll get a phone call. Hey, there's a new shipwreck. It just showed up, and then, so we'll go out and we'll find these things. And sometimes they're on the shoreline where they've been buried. We've looked at them, and then a new storm comes in, uncovers them, and it's a brand new shipwreck. And hey, there's a shipwreck. And said, yeah, we actually know all about that. And so this is an example of one of these after one of our storms up there. But this is not what I'm here to talk to you about. <laughs> so. People tell us about shipwrecks, storms uncover shipwrecks for us, and then, but we do survey, we do survey looking for uh, shipwrecks ourselves. 
And so we have instruments that we use. One's called the magnetometer. We tow it behind the boat, and it's sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. And we're looking for small deviations from the Earth's magnetic field, which is associated with iron. Okay. Well, shipwrecks can have a lot of iron. There can be a lot of iron just in the ballast stones that we ship. It could be cannons, it could be anchors, things like that. But that's one way we have to find shipwrecks. That's how we found this one. So this is the keelson, the very large, long stringer timber inside the ship, and then you cut this mortise, and that's where the base of the main mast is. And if you know anything about shipbuilding, we looked at old ships and such, this is huge timber. It's made out of mahogany. Okay. We eventually, we worked on this ship for several years, and we, we identified the ship. It's the Nuestra Señora del Rosario and Santiago Apostle. We call it Rosario for short. And so it was actually built in the New World. It was built in 1686. So a very early ship. But it, it makes it really important because it was built in the New World. It wasn't built in Europe. And so we're seeing different wood types, different wood construction, because they had massive timbers that they could build the ships with. But this isn't what I'm here to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> so we work underwater. And... Uh, so I, I'm a diver. I've been a diver for a long time. I'm getting old enough now where the students kind of watch me like the old guy that's going to fall off the, the dive platform, which has actually happened. And so they take care of me now, which, which I think is pretty good. So I think in some ways they must like me because they try to keep me safe. And, uh, I'm a little bit accident prone. But sometimes we have to remove meters worth of sand that's covering up these ships. But that's the good part, is the sand is covered them up, it's cut off the oxygen, it's cut off light, and that's what allows some of the lower wooden holes of these ships to survive. I don't know we wouldn't have them at all. And they can be very intact. But, you know, this is internal pumping to a ship, and you see some of the frames of the ship back there. That wood, it looks sound, but if you bring it up and just let it dry out, a lot of the internal cellular structure is decayed. And that water evaporates, it actually exerts a contractile force to cause those wood cells to collapse. The wood shrinks, it twists, it's dramatic. And so that's the things that I applied my science background to, was to learn the techniques of artifact conservation to figure out the best way to remove the water safely, give strength to the wood, from the different artifacts that we see. But this ship's not what I'm here to talk to you. So this is my this is the bread and butter shipwreck for me, and so this was the ship that brought me to Florida. It was discovered in 1992. We call it a manual point one. So if you're familiar with Florida history, and a lot of people are not, particularly if you grew up in the Midwest like I I did, um, the Spanish arrived in Pensacola, not well, Pensacola in Florida, you know, early on in the early 1500s. And, had scouted it out, made a number of expeditions and such. Then they went on into Mexico, and then they had colonies also in South America. And they were finding gold, and they were finding silver, and they were sending it back to Spain on their treasure ships, the treasure fleets, and such like that. And you guys know about Mel Fisher, I'm sure. But this is early on, and so the Spanish <coughs> were worried that the French, in particular, would come on over as well, and they would set up a, a base, a naval base, somewhere in what we call Florida today. The Spanish called it La Florida. And so they organized a large expedition to colonize that part of Florida. They were going to build an overland road and build a second colony, Santa Elena, connected by road, very ambitious. <coughs> they brought 12 ships, 1,500 colonists, horses and uh, food supplies to last a year and they arrived in Pensacola and they thought that the safest place to leave the supplies was on board the ships. Now, unfortunately five weeks after they landed there was a, probably a category five hurricane. Seven of the ships were destroyed. One was blown up on land but six of them were lost in the bay and from the description it sounds like they grounded on in the shallows out there and they broke apart. 
And when the first one of these ships was found in 1992, we didn't know if it was one of those at that time. But eventually, you know, after several years of excavation and looking at the artifacts, you know, we, we were able to, you know, firmly state this was one of the ships of Don Tristan de Luna and the Arellano. And uh, so we, we found this uh, ship from 1559 in Pensacola Bay. That spade fish has been on every shipwreck I've ever worked in. <laughs> Just a couple of the artifacts from that. Um, that's uh, a large copper pitcher where the copper's been converted into a brittle copper sulfide. And the pottery piece that you see at the top there, that's Aztec. And we know that the Spanish actually uh, brought 100 Aztec warriors with them. Pensacola. So it, it tied in Mexico, it tied in the Aztecs. Great finds. That's what I've learned hull construction, ship construction, but what I, I really like is working with artifacts that tell a story about the people. And so this is what we call historical archaeology, which means we have documents that we're looking at the documents. Documents don't tell the whole story, and so we use archaeology to fill in the gaps that. But, you know, this is a great document from 1559. You can kind of see the date there at the top. But this is a report that was sent back to Mexico by Luna, the leader, saying, this is that bad, this is what happened. We lost all these ships, you know, you gotta help us out. And then we actually have his signature, which is pretty cool, I think. So it says, Don Tristan de Luna y Arellano. Beautiful artifacts right off the bat to work with copper cooking cauldrons, copper skillets, and, and then things we expected to find pottery, ceramics, um, stone cannon balls, you know, lots and lots of things. And these were not treasure ships, though. These were ships that were bringing colonists. So we weren't expecting to find treasure, we're not treasure hunters. We do the archaeology, we let the history speak for itself, and that's what's important. So, we were working at the time with the Florida State Underwater Archaeologist. His name was Dr. Roger Smith. Roger hired me. Roger had a full time job in Tallahassee. He would get some free time, he'd come to Pensacola and he would work with us. But it was myself and originally just a team of 300 people. And every day we'd go out and work on the shipwreck. And we'd find things we'd report to Roger. <coughs> So one day we found this artifact and we were kind of describing it to him. It was still in the water. And we thought, you know, it's curved. It could it be a bell? Uh, could it be the mouth of a large mortar like cannon or something? We hadn't uncovered it completely at that point. We call him on the phone and describe it. He goes, well, maybe it's a breastplate. Sure enough, it turned out he identified it on the phone from Tallahassee. But it's Spanish armor. And so this was iron, and iron corrodes 10 times faster underwater than it does in air. And so there's a lot of oxygen dissolved in the water, and it'll start to rust. That rusting will actually change the pH of the water. And when that happens, it's an electrochemical reaction that causes the minerals in the seawater to fall out of solution. They're attracted to the iron, and they form this concretion. Once it's completely encased in this concretion or incrustation, sometimes we call it, there's a type of bacteria, an anaerobic bacteria, that will convert it into copper sulfide or iron sulfide. In this case, and the iron all goes away. And so then it's a challenge, okay, well what, can, can we cast it? Can we replicate the shape and do these things? Wow. Well, I'd like to say that's what I did, but that's a replica. <laughs> So we loaded this thing up, we took it to a local hospital, we had a CAT scan. Based on the CAT scan images, we were able to get um, the keeper of armor for the Tower of London to look at those CAT scans, and he told us then that this was the shape of the original breastplate, and that it was probably for a size large man at the time. It was not for a uh, foot soldier, it was for a, someone that had, had ridden a horse, actually where it was cut. And so we had that on display for a number of years, and this was kind of my albatross of working on it slowly. And eventually I gave it over to 
one of my graduate students, and so he's you know, he's close to my age, or somewhere in there, but he's you know a retired uh, chaplain uh, from the Navy, and so he came back to school because he enjoys it, and he's really good at this. He's really patient. He was able to take the original concretion and start working with the epoxy cast that I had started, and then he finished it. And so that's then from the original, but this is so significant important it made it into archaeology magazine, you know, which is a big publication for archaeology for us and to get in there. And we, we actually found it had a few decorations on it and it had what's known as a medial ridge, meaning the original interpretation was wrong. And so this actually pushed the date back a little bit uh, for us. But uh, you can spend years working on these things. So this would be a parallel to what our kids <coughs> looked like originally, different from the rough one that we had made. And so archaeology is time consuming, but you know, it's worth the effort. So I work with lots of different kinds of artifacts, ceramics, the pottery that we find. And we have all the different techniques for those depending on what really needs to happen. You know, wooden artifacts, sometimes we treat them with a substance called polyethylene glycol. So it's a wax like substance that we let the wood, uh, the water be replaced by the, the, the peg, as we call it, over time. Uh, small artifacts work really well if we can freeze dry them. We look for everything that we can find, just like we've been looking for everything that we can find on these Cuban chugs out here. We're looking at really small details in there. And you, know, you spend a lot of time, you start looking at them, and some of them look kind of similar out there, the ones made out of aluminum, but they're all a little bit different, and they all have a little bit different styles of construction, and uh, that's really important and neat to, to, to document that. Of course, these are all pits, you probably recognize them, but we're, these are all our pits from 1559. And so my boss at the time said, well, what else can we learn about those all pits, John? So I went to the grocery store, and I bought a can of black olives because I really like black olives. And they were sold by Vlasic, by Vlasic Pickle. So I called Vlasic Pickle on the phone and I said, could I talk to someone who's really knowledgeable about olives? And they said, well, actually, we're a subsidiary of Campbell's Soup. So I called Campbell's Soup. And the lady answered the phone, you know, you explain to them, well, I'm an archaeologist working in Florida. I'm working on a 16th century Spanish shipwreck. I found some olive pits. <coughs> more about it, she does well. We get our olives from the California Olive Growers Association. We work with the man named John Daniels. So I called John Daniels in California, and I told him. And he says, are they in good shape? And I said, they're in real good shape. And he says, put them on a photocopier, lay a ruler next to them, and fax that photocopy to me. And then within an hour, he sent me back the report, and he says, you have two types of olives. You have a type known as the Cevolano, and a type known as the Queen. He says one was grown for its large meat content, and one was grown for its high olive oil content. And I said, well, these arrived via from Mexico. And I said, were they growing olives in Mexico in 1559? He said, no, they were bringing them, introducing them at the time. He said, those olives were being grown in Spain, probably very close to Seville. So I get excited about that kind of story to track it down. And so, you know, we're going to look at everything. Okay, we work very diligently. We watch in the water and we see little things that are floating and we collect them. And obviously, those are insect parts. Okay, and so most of those belong to this guy, <laughs> Paraplaneta americana, so commonly known as the American cockroach. Well, it did originate in America, it actually comes from Africa, but it was brought here by Spanish ships originally to do that. And so to determine that identification, I actually went to Gainesville and I had some of these in a Ziploc bag. And I talked to him on the phone and said, well, we may be able to look at the wax that's contained in the cuticle and we can do um, some tests looking at the type and we may be able to identify it for you. I said, okay. So I walk in the door and the guy looks at my bag and holds it up light and says, Oh, he didn't tell me it looked like this. He says, that's Paraplanet American. And so he's explaining it all. And he goes, we've got some growing in the back. And he came out with this big jar of live cockroaches. And he said, 
what do you feed him? He says, dog food. And I said, what's the best way to kill him? He said, step on him. <laughs> but, uh, so we found the wings, and we found this cap, which is called the pronotum. But all this is not really what I came to talk to you about. <laughs> so we have really good organic preservation on our shipwrecks because of the sediments that cover them. So we find shoes, portions, fragments of shoes, fragments of boots. We find the food remains that the people brought with them. Eat. Cow, chicken, pig, sheep, goat. We find the fruits, tropical fruits, sapote, the holly pits as I showed you, uh, peach pits, cherry pits, stones. And so there's a lot of work to it. And sometimes you don't really great stories. So you find small things like this. So do you recognize those? So they belong to black rat, Rathus ratus, and they belong to um, actually some mice, which we found, which was unusual. But I had written about this in a paper that we found, uh, rat bones. And so there's an expert on everything. So there's a gentleman, his name was Philip Armitage, he was a European specialist who looked at the transmission of diseases via the rat. He retired in Sanibel Island, Florida. <laughs> I mailed him a package of rat bones. And then he sent me a report back. And he says, well, you have rats, baby rats, young rats, old rats. You have mice. And he goes, your rats are suffering from rickets and uh, lack of vitamin D, just like people. If you don't get out in the sunlight and drink dairy uh, products, you know, you, you'll have the same problem. But, uh, Good things. I've since uh, taken these and we're, we're doing other things to find out what they were eating. So the work keeps going on. We found a manual point two. That was a manual point one. We found a manual point two in 2006. So it was another ship that we were able to associate with the 1559 expedition. Beautiful things. Uh, a spoon made of olive wood, you know, which people had a spoon, people had a knife. People didn't have a fork but this belonged to an individual sailor. We found this, this is made of ivory. That's an ivory manicure set. Uh, it's kind of like the uh, multi-tool of today, but for cleaning your fingernails, cleaning your ears, there's a, a one arm is missing one. It would have been a little spoon, and that would have been for the earwax. But we brought it into the lab, and that's where we make a lot of discoveries sometimes. We're cleaning it, and then we found it's all a little hole back there and if you look carefully, you can see there's a reed in there. It's actually a whistle, and it still works. Stone cannonballs. Okay, we found a manual point three in uh, 2016. And so our third ship there. <laughs> It's time for saving work, and so this is a water induction drain. It's much like the new water vacuum. We remove all the sand and silt between the wooden timbers, and this runs through a screen. <laughs> Small artifacts that you might not see with your eye, and the fresh water as well. The really surprising thing is this ship is in the 7 feet of water. The other two, it says, are only 12 feet long. And they were anchored in the bay at the time the hurricane struck, and they were doing the same thing. So we have beautiful wood, you know, from that time period. Okay, so sometimes we work in seven feet of water, but occasionally we go out to the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is a wreck that was, it's in about 90 feet of water. And uh, dates to the late 19th century, but we're working on this one. And so that's actually me. I'm, I'm reporting this large anchor that's with it. And this is our dive safety officer. He's wearing a reed breather, but he's he's just there to protect me because you can't see it. But over here, there's a whole bunch of sharks. And so we do see sharks, not very often. And that day we did. And so he was just kind of watching out for me while I'm recorded the same thing. And kind of rounded out uh, airplanes. We have airplanes in Pensacola because the Naval Air Station. And so we have airplanes associated with the World War II time period. 
uh, naval, naval aviators, unfortunately, some of them lost their planes because of training exercises. And so we've documented a number of these about 100 feet of water out there. So you find things like this, and then your students, just like these guys, uh, don't think it as a thesis topic or maybe a thesis title. But this isn't what I'm really here to talk to you about. And so, you mentioned again, I teach students artifact conservation, and I work in the lab, and uh, students do most of the work uh, today for me. But everything we bring in, and we figure out the best way to clean it, and then figure out the best conservation of treatment for it. I rely on experts all the time to help me identify things. Okay, An example, the Cuban chugs out here, there's a bunch of ancients of those things. I know a little bit about ancients, but not very much. Okay, Well, you know, one says Nissan on it. Obviously, that came from a Nissan. Okay, well, the one in your book that says Marriott, that's actually a Deutz two-cylinder air-cooled engine made in Germany. That's in that boat out there. Okay, I found people that could help me identify them. Ingots out there. One of your outboards, it says, uh, uh, I just found this. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a mercury outboard to it. And then you've got uh, others that are diesel and things. And so I'm going to find the people that I need to to help me identify things. So we have an expert that helps us identify phones. And so she actually made a small mistake, but it was a good mistake. So she said, John does her from a dog. Does her vertebrae from a dog. And I was excited about this. We've got a dog in Pensacola on a shipwreck that's like 1559. And um, so I thought that was really neat. And uh, dogs hadn't turned into all the breeds that we have today. And so we kind of a standard dog at the time. But I was jealous of the shipwreck in England called the Mary Rose, which was Henry VIII's ship. Almost for the same time period, from 1545. Well, they had a dog. They had the whole dog and skeleton, and they named it Hatch, and they did DNA, and they found out all kinds of cool things for the dog. Well, now I have a dog, so I was excited about this. So I wanted to find out a little bit more about mine. I wanted to find out what size it was, maybe, what you could learn from just those few vertebrae that were found. So I sent them to Auburn University, to the College of Veterinary Medicine. Auburn, where my wife went to school, and so we were proud that Auburn could do this for me. And so I said, can you give me some more information, maybe what size dog I had, and anything about it? And they said, sure, we'll take a look. And then they contacted me and said, John, you have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was even better, a 16th century cat. So cats got a bad rep in reputation in the 16th century because the church didn't. They were associated with Celtic religion. They were associated with the Egyptians. Cats, you know, were kind of evil. <laughs> and uh, so there were people that liked cats, but there were a lot of people that did not like cats. And so to find a cat on the ship was actually you know, pretty unique, but we did. And um, so I've taken, we found a few more bones, actually, and I was able to send a couple off to Oxford. And they were able to isolate DNA, kind of. So, we learned that the cat is the same haplotype, gene type, basically, as Iron Age cats in England. And it, and it compares well to one that goes back to Turkey earlier, and, uh, which is pretty neat. And so this cat's included in a study for the arrival of cats in the northwestern Europe and now the Americas. So he's a famous cat. Important, too, um, we train students to document things, to make the drawings, to learn all the proper ship names, uh, floors and footings, and the frames, and the stem, and the stern post, and all the great names. Okay. Well, you can apply those names to the chugs. And you have to kind of use your imagination in a few cases, but it, it works pretty well. And so we've been talking all kinds of ship names for the past couple of days, ship parts. But this is kind of here what I'm to talk to you about. So I think this collection is fantastic. To have this many, and you have different styles and techniques. So I think they're really important. Um, Misha asked one of the tasks that was, you know, should we keep all your vessels or should you get rid of them? I don't think you should get rid of any of them. I think you should keep them all. I think they're all important. Um, I, I actually really think that 
this is vessel number one. I remember this way. I like vessel number one. I like vessel number four a great deal because these are so unique, you know, compared to the others and stuff. Just you know, showing the ingenuity and the thought, you know, to make something to make that 90 mile trail, you know, across the Florida states to do that. Okay, and you guys have seen this. You know, most of you, I'm sure, have seen this. But you know, we look at it in detail. And of course, there's inner tubes in here, which was the flotation. And this had, at one point, a new board engine. It has some lifting handles on it. It has one wheel that survives. You know, someone probably built this in a garage or the bottom part of the house, and they were able to pick it up and roll it down to the beach and launch this. And so to use rebar, two different types. And you know, I think that one's special. Okay, this one, you know, it, it, it's, it was a boat that was built as a fishing boat, okay, but it was used for this story. So I think, you know, it, it adds to your collection because it's another type yet that you know, shows the different types of vessels involved. Okay. So I don't think it's the, as, as significant as the others because, you know, it's not home built. So to speak, but yeah, it's 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 significant, but it's part of the collection in total. As is this one, okay. And so this is your number three, the one that Muriel painted on the stern, okay. So this is the one that has the, the German engine in it. In the back. Uh, so again, it's showing the different types of vessels that were employed in this because it has the name that's associated with the 1980 event. You know, it's significant. Unfortunately, this one's in the worst shape. You could move it. You could. Some of the the timbers in really bad shape. Some of it's okay. You know, you could replace parts of it. You know, you have to make a decision. Um, this is one that needs to be protected from the elements. You know, at, at least raised up to get it from direct contact with the ground. You know, it's a mine for the this one, for sure. Okay. And then another one of my favorites, this one, you know, to look at it, and then the you know, gas tanks that were built inside of it, you know, we, doc we document all this, we're counting all the stations of the iron bands that were formed this. You look at it long enough, you figure out, okay, how they built this? You know, this one, they built the iron framework first, and they, they Fix the shape that is a boat shape, particularly if you look at the transom, how it's shaped there. They you know, have forethought in the units. They knew what a, a stable boat would look like and what they need to do. They built it from what they could to find. And then this tube is a, it's com it's commercially sewn. So I'm not sure what this was. I'd love to know. And then they modified it themselves and so it was built. But it's obvious that they placed this in there, and then they've made small slits in there, if you look. And that's where they injected the spray foam into it. And those slits probably got wider when they did that. So we're documenting how it was built and, and, and those things. And so that one, I think, is really important. OK. And everybody has to like this one, because they came with the flag in it. And you know, it's a great color. Um, the Gullah people in Charleston and Savannah, they paint a lot of their homes, the front doors in particular, with a color called hate blue. I'm not sure if this is hate blue, or, you know, but they, they color intentional. Um, that's to ward off evil spirits. You know, maybe maybe they, that was chosen for others. I don't know for sure. But you know, the American flag painted on it, which makes it you know really significant, showing your hope to become United States citizens again. So this one and. Most of the others, you know, this is what I've been calling a type three. Okay, it's aluminum panels that they drill holes into and they put in nuts and bolts. And then they're taking fiberglass and they put it over the seams to make these things watertight. We've added spray foam in cases. Some, not all, of course, you know, have the extra pontoon for stability and flotation purposes. And they all have a slightly different approach on what they could find to do that. So Again, you know, you look at the whole collection, that's what's important. And you think this effort that you've made to get this grant is really important to take the next step then to really make the 
things of what you could do and what needs to happen. So this is an example. Oh, okay, so we worked here yesterday till four, and then we thought we had to leave, so we left. And then, but these guys are great, and so they haven't even been to Key West yet downtown. <laughs> that really impressed me. So we're staying in a condo, just about a mile and a quarter from here. And they went home and started taking their notes from the day and recopying them and then making it so it could be understood by anybody that looks at them. But we're documenting all the dimensions of these because it's really important to get that documentary record in case anything does happen to them and they're lost. I want, I plan to uh, present these votes with uh, permission from you guys to uh, the Society for Historical Archaeology and the Conference for the Underwater Archaeology. It's held every January. This year, it's in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, so that's my goal. Is to, I think they're that important that I want to make a topic for my paper to go over there and present it uh, next January. So recommendations. Okay, I think all of them need to be looking off the ground. Okay, because setting that close contact to the ground is it's not good, particularly for the two that are really made out of tarps and the Mario, to get them up. The aluminum ones, it, it, it's not as critical, but it's critical for those three. It's also probably critical for the, the larger fishing boat to get it up. You can see some of the strengths have sprung already. Misha uh, sent me background information when we started this project. And one of those things was someone has already designed a quick sketch of a cradle for the chugs. Okay. I didn't know if that would be the best one or not. So we've actually contacted an architectural firm and we're, we're thinking they're going to do it pro bono. But to, to come up with a design that we think would be most suitable for a cradle. And you want something that's going to fit your style, you know, the area and not do a tracing to what you're doing out there. Okay. Audience, okay, there's trees going out there. I don't know if you're going to move the trees, you probably don't want to move the trees. I don't know what you want to do. I know you, I've heard you mention that you maybe want to plant, plant some of the timber around some of those things. I don't know that all of them need awnings. Some of them would benefit from awnings. So the, the two that are all made from the tarpaulin material one in four, okay? So when sunlight hits them, sunlight causes its photo degradation, it will break it down. And you can see like the yellow one, how the color goes almost to white in places. It, it needs to be protected really from direct sunlight and stuff like that. Um, the, the aluminum ones have the spray foam in them, but I may have a different plan for that one. If you didn't want to cluster the area with every one of them, or we looked at the footprint too of the whole space. That's a large footprint there, so to put in line with the whole area. So kind of give you some different ideas. Maybe some of them would you want to do first in the place. Okay. So initially, because of the spray foam that's in these things, I can even work as an archaeologist with thinking about trying to preserve uh, spray insulation foam. This is new to me. I, I don't work with aluminum that much either. And so you had some materials that were kind of new to me, so I had to think out of the box of the two of these. So I actually <coughs> contacted BASF. You've heard of them. They're the, chemi the largest chemical company in the world. And they make lots of products, including spray insulation foam. They're headquartered in Germany. I wrote a message to the company, and I told them about this project. And I wanted to know what they might suggest for making the lo a longer life for that foam out there, because that's important as part of it as well. So my message ended up in Germany, and then it was forwarded to someone in the United States and Florida. The answer they gave me, which I did not like at all, was that, well, they suggested that we remove this foam, which is already showing deterioration signs, and replace it. No, <laughs> you don't do that in historic preservation. You want to preserve the original integrity of the vessels. So, I tried another company, and there's another company called Lapola, Lapola Industries, and they're also another very large company that makes spray station. I got a chemist there, and he was really good. He recommended a product 
It's made through one of their subsidiaries. It's called by Andic. It's called Clear Coat FP. So a high performance clear floral polymer. Okay. It's UV resistant. It will work. It's compatible with every part of the vessel out there. So you can put it on metal, you can put it on wood, you can put it on the foam, and it's gonna form a surface film that it's not very noticeable. To really extend the life from being outdoors in the elements. Okay. It's $159 a gallon. So it's applied by the same type of an air sprayer that a very high end commercial painter would use for like cabinetry work and stuff like that. It's, it's probably something that someone could do already in Key West area that does that sort of thing. You know, it's applied at a certain pressure point in detail for 2,000 psi. Anyways, so I know that information that I'm going to give to you, but I like this. Um, so I asked him for a sample. I live on a farm. And uh, my wife took me home to the farm, her farm. And we have stuff because it's a farm. So I looked around for stuff that replicated what the chugs are made of aluminum and things like that. So, anyways, I found some license plates made of aluminum. So Matt did this. So Matt did all this work in my lab. I gave him the product and I told him, you know, try this out and see what it looks like. So and this shows up better on my computer if you see the real thing here in a second. Um, but anyways, we were really pleased with this. And we tried it on wood samples that had been out in the sun, kind of very similar to some of the wood we pieces have gotten here. And, uh, well, I actually liked it uh, quite a bit. And then to find things that are also well suitable. So you have iron strapping on many of these vessels out there and such. Okay. So they're already rusted. I don't you don't want to alter the character too much. You want to keep it the character is important to you as well. So taking this one and this before and this is the after and everything. Okay. We even tried it on spray foam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and you actually, you, you can't, you, you don't really notice it on it, so I think it's going to be ideal for that. So, that's what I have for you tonight. You know, I thank Key West Tropical Forest for the Botanical Garden and the Florida Division of Historical Resources for providing the grant that's allowed me to come and bring students here. Questions? Can you go back to the slide of the chemical? Can you take a picture uh, <laughs> for us? <laughs> We're in the salt water a lot. <laughs> that looks amazing. Very good. Yep. And on Russ's product, he has a chemical that works really good. Um, it's PR something. Yeah, there's a number PR. of things. If I was just treating metal. Yeah, but it's PR what? PR 15. You would love it. You don't even have to correct the rust, and it'll stop it from rusting. Just coats it. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. But it's for metal. Right, and, and that was the thing is, if I was approaching 